back uh what's up what's up testing testing one two is what i said blue nix is our only crowd but we'll give blue nix our best show even though he's probably gonna leave halfway through because he's lives in sweden but anyways um uh, <laughs> what is up welcome back to science hd episode six and uh thank you for keeping me in check i would have been muted that whole entire show and have been awkward but uh, anyways we are back episode six we have some cool things to talk about and it's me, Nolan, and it's heroes. Yes, okay. yeah. I, want, I I wanted to get some vocal in there, <laughs> and then it's Rose. Um, and uh, I don't have any safety gear on either. Oh, well, I guess the lab coat safety gear, but uh, Rose doesn't do any experiments over there. I'm doing an experiment, although yeah. I'm not actually doing an experiment today. I just it's the aesthetic, man. Um, anyways. Uh, I don't really have any announcements or anything, so I guess we'll jump right into it. This could be a short episode. Yeah. I don't have much. Yeah. Neither do I. I have, I have a little bit, though. Yeah. So, um, I actually found something cool, like, right before the show, and then I took some suggestions from you, Rose, so two out of the three things I'm going to say is literally from you, and then <laughs> one of them is just, like, a cool thing that I saw or found right before we started this so anyways i'll jump on the first segment to warm us up you know get comfortable and uh okay, i can't see the slides by the way because my computer is slowly slow so i'm trying to catch up so you might have to tell me like hey do tend to talk when it is my time to talk uh well the slides that you have are the ones from before so yeah you already know what's up with that and then i'll just tell you when i'm on yours but I, i'll go first Anyways, so anyways, uh, I really wanted to call this segment, who you calling a pinhead? Um, because it's great like that. What up, you went to? So who you calling a pinhead is because I'm going to be talking about a guy, Patrick Starr, Patrick freaking Starr, man. Um, I'm actually not going to be talking about Patrick Star, but I'll be talking about Starfish because I feel like no one knows what Starfish do. And Rose suggested I should talk about Starfish because I'm assuming she doesn't really know what they do either. Do you? Yeah, a little bit. What do you yeah, know? A little bit. I just know that if you chop off their leg, it grows back. <laughs> Does that mean the, the leg itself grows a whole other Starfish, doesn't it? Does it? That's interesting. Um, I think it does. I think... I don't know. Maybe it doesn't. Maybe I'm crazy, but I, I like to don't know. I'd have to look that up. I'm gonna look it up right now. Why? That reminds me. I had a, I had a question today. This is gonna be a tangent. Good. We, we can save it for later, but we just got we just got to talk about it. <laughs> and it's the it's a question that I felt really dumb for thinking because I feel like the answer should have been straight in my like ready like looking me in the face, but for some reason I was like, this doesn't feel right. Because your entire life, you know how like in um elementary school when you're talking about uh living organisms they tell you that the like the basic building block of all life is like a cell yeah yeah like that's like it's, it's almost up there with like if someone asks you like what the mitochondria mitochondria is you should be able to say like oh it's the powerhouse of the cell for me when you talk <laughs> about cells i'm like oh that's the basic block of like all living things um but then i was thinking well if what's a cell made of Oh, that's just it. That's the atoms. same. I think I feel like that. Yeah, atoms. But then what are atoms yeah. made of? Um, but then just then like the I feel like that's the same exact energy, if not almost the same question as if you were to keep zooming out of a Earth, you get solar system out of solar system, galaxy out of galaxy, universe out of universe. What? And then you just keep asking what, 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 until you end up at we don't know. And I feel like that's the same thing inverted. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I feel like there was always a separation in my head between, like, if it was alive, 
it was cells. If it wasn't alive, it's like your basic atom. But really everything alive too is also made up of atoms. Like cells are made up of atoms. So when you get deeper into it. So I was thinking like, okay, like chlorophyll, right? That's what's, that's the green stuff. That's what makes, what makes leaves green. Yeah. Like what's that made out of? Like, well, everything event and all, and all organic matter is carbon based. So that means that it has to be made with carbon in it. Right? Uh, I'm not crazy. You know, so like that, ha there has to be atoms within cells. The reason in my head, I was like, there was this separation where like, if it's alive, it's a cell and it's just a cell, there's something smaller than a cell. And if it w wasn't alive, then it's atoms. But that, that separation doesn't exist. But somewhere elementary school really failed me and it, there wanted to be a separation. <laughs> Well, I think back to what you're saying was, I think everything organic, I don't know. I, 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 that's a really bold statement. And I feel like it's true because all organic molecules have to have a carbon and a hydrogen in it, I think. And uh, once you have a carbon and a hydrogen, it's an organic molecule. If it doesn't have any of those, it's inorganic. So I think all right. organic things do have carbon in it. Right. Well, or, organic chemistry is carbon-based chemistry. Right. That's It has carbons and hydrogens in it and everything in chemistry. And you would think, oh, it's easier. Hell no. no. Hell no, it's not easier. If it, takes, if it takes an entire class to talk about like a specific element on the periodic table, I don't think it's easier. <laughs> it's not even a specific element. You talk about a lot of elements, but it's... The hardest thing of organic chemistry, just to shout, this is funny because Patrick Starr is just staring. Patrick is literally <laughs> on my screen just staring. You know when he has the chocolate bag? I'm explaining it to Rose because she yeah, can't oh, see yeah. it. Where he stands with the chocolate bag, he just stares with a smile. That's just it. And I love it. Um, let's burn something alive and try to make charcoal. That's an experiment. Okay, next time. Um, and diamonds. Wow. You're making diamonds out of your dead dog's ashes. Jeez. Wow. I know people that I not know people, but I know that people do I've that with their parents' ashes. They'll make wedding rings out of people's ashes with they'll make diamonds. But anyways, what I'm saying is about hardest thing about organic chemistry, if you've ever considered taking it, anyone out there, the hardest thing is mechanisms. Just know that. It's basically how molecules move when certain things happen in reactions or I don't know. It's kind of like a joke because not a joke, but I wouldn't say it's a joke, but it's kind of weird because molecules are always moving. So it's never in just one spot, but you kind of learn it as in like, oh, if this happened, then this one, it's really confusing. But just remember mechanisms is the hardest. And once you ever, whenever you see that, just know that you're in you know, for a treat. And I ain't talk about chocolate. I hope there's someone that like really loves organic chemistry and like, I loved mechanisms. Oh, well, probably. <laughs> I mean, there's people out there that, it's easy for them. I'd say that's just the hardest part. I'm not saying it's impossible or anything, but like, yeah, I'd yeah. I'd say my favorite part was um, naming and building the molecule based off the name. So, yeah, yeah. So, anyways, um, <laughs> starfish. <laughs> we went from starfish <laughs> to organic chemistry somehow. Um, <laughs> Starfish, let me talk about them real quick. Let me pull in my iPad for notes, just reference notes. Like I looked at this, but I just need reference notes. So you might not have guessed, but starfish are actually considered carnivores. For scientifically illiterate people that still want to watch me, that means they eat meat. In the ocean, it's a little weird because there's like no technically meat in the ocean from what we all consider. Because uh, some people don't consider fish meat, I guess. That drives me nuts. When you're a vegetarian and people tell you, oh, just eat fish. Like, no, that it's not. <laughs> I still can't eat that. <laughs> it's just a different type of meat, I guess. I don't know. It right. is kind of like its own thing because it looks weird. But um, anyways, starfish don't eat fish. They don't eat fish. They eat mollusks. So that includes clams, mussels, oysters. And that's what they like eating. And they pry them open with their little spongy legs that, that you always know. Notable starfish in pop culture is Patrick Starr and the starfish from Finding Nemo that I don't remember the name of. Uh, this was all I could think of. What was his name? But I got a picture on here that looks like both of them because they're both pink. Like but, 
I think there's a lot of different species of starfish. So don't just think of like, oh, just one starfish and there's only one type of starfish. No, a lot like a lot of fish in the ocean there. There's many species and subspecies of them. So I don't know the number off the top of my head. That's what I meant to look up. But there's many different species, not just one. And then another thing when I'm like looking at a starfish, I'm like, hmm, how did these things reproduce? Because you never just see a starfish lay on top of another starfish. Or you don't see, I don't know, you just don't see them move, really. It's kind of, they always, they always just kind of stand there. They're like snails, though. What? Are they asexual? No, they're not asexual. Oh, really? Yeah, so what they'll do is they'll move in the same general area as each other, and they're kind of like fish in this way, where they reproduce without even touching each other. They'll just be in the same general area, and then one of them releases their eggs, and another one releases their sperm, and somehow meets. That's all I've got. That's all I got. What? Um, I don't know if it just floats in the air or if there's like an egg pile and then the male starfish sits on top of it because some fish, the female will lay eggs in a nest somewhere on the ground and then the male fish will come out by and then spray all his sperm all over it still in the open waters. Um, so not all the sperm makes it there, but you know, so starfish are similar in that they have no contact. They have no physical contact and they reproduce like that. So they're not asexual. And I looked up your thing. It says starfish are famous for their ability to regenerate limbs and in Mm -hmm. some cases entire bodies. And this is possible because most of their vital organs are within their arms. Um. So the anatomy for starfish are is a bit weird. Um a lot of their stuff apparently is in their arms, but also their mouth is in the center, and so is their anus. And their mouth and anus are similar spots. So there's not a, it's not like all one hole, but there's multiple holes, and you might not be able to see it. But yeah, they basically shovel in, they shuffle things towards the center, and they'll pry open clams and stuff. And they don't, they're not fast moving, and they have a bunch of little suction cuppy tentacle things on the bottom to move along and. Yeah, they're very weird animals, but... And they do have eyes, by the way. And their eyes... Yeah, they're on the tips of their of their legs, things. They're no. Not... So, that, like, an, an anatomically correct Patrick would not look like Patrick. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, Patrick's so incorrect. His mouth would be, like, where his belly button is. So would his butthole. Not on opposite sides, on the same face of his body. And then... His eyes would be mu- multiplied by 2.5, and um, he would have them on all of the ends of his limbs. So, yeah, I want someone that does those like um, like haunted images or whatever, and like to, like a, that they actually draw. I want them to draw an anatomic anatomically correct Patrick Star. Now, I want to see it. I remember there's like this picture of a realistic Patrick Star, as in like if he had like flesh. You know what I mean? Not realistic, <laughs> yeah. but, you know, if he had flesh. So, yeah. So, Patrick Star is awesome. And that's how mm-hmm. they reproduce. Also, let's just... The reproduction thing, where something is laid and then something else is spraying stuff, is called spawning. So, I see a lot of fish do it. A lot of fish. You might hear spawning with fish. And then... uh when they grow up and they they don't just become uh, starfish. A lot of animal life in the ocean is weird, and that's why marine biology is not the same thing as biology, um, is because a lot of the developing stages is, called, is lar- larval, and then they are a plankton. So a lot of things are become planktons or like a stationary f- feeding thing that plants in the ground looks nothing like their mature level it doesn't even look close sorry i have allergies or something (laughs) okay there we go so they don't even look like close to what they actually look like so a starfish might is looks like a plankton and is a plankton until it develops 
mature and becomes a starfish. And I don't, I did not look up what the plankton looks like. I should have done that. Dang it. I should have done that. But, but yeah, so technically, if we're going to rewrite SpongeBob, Patrick should become a plankton, not saying plankton himself, a plankton, and then grow up into a starfish and maybe not live under a rock, but just on a rock. And then he likes eating clams, oysters, and mussels, and his eyes are on his legs, <laughs> and his mouth's on his belly button, so is his butthole, and yeah, there you go, <laughs> someone recreate that out there, oh goodness, I could try, Cart- per- cartoon drawings are not, not the best for me, they're kind of hard, <laughs> yeah, any drawing is like that for me, so, <laughs> But yeah, rest in peace. Big rip to the sperm soldiers for the starfish. Yeah. I wonder how much sperm is just floating in the ocean. I never thought about that. I don't know. If I, I don't think I want to think about that. <laughs> There's probably reasons I never thought about that. But anyways, on our <laughs> next saggy segment. Ooh. Defending math. Ew. Okay, I have a I have a story time on why I was inspired to talk about math. Um, so I was Do it. I was a sub for my hometown high school. Okay, and I was a math teacher for like a week, and I was able to like actually teach math. It wasn't just like busy work. Like I wasn't just giving the kids like worksheets and being like, here, do this. Like I had to like I had to teach them, and mm-hmm. that's not what I'm going to school for. I mean, I can do it. I, ha- I have a math minor have that under my belt now i do have a math minor officially really um, yeah completed all my credits but now i think i'm like i just keep going i guess because why not so i'll go after a math major too because it's an it's an easy grasp <laughs> so you're getting a degree uh faster than me i don't know about that because you have one year left right you're done yeah but i don't have a minor <laughs> You don't have your oh well you didn't my my major is tiered to, to have a math minor because it requires so much math anyways. Yeah. So I'll, I'll have a math minor no matter what. Oh, um, so you got that I, section over with because you like, just like math that much and you did it first. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um. Anyways, so I was I was a math teacher at my local high school and I got asked by a student. He goes, "I have a question because the the OG teacher wasn't there." She gets asked this a lot. She, just, she gets tired of the question after you've been a teacher for 30 years. <laughs> you know? She's like, I have to ask you a question. He goes, when are we going to use this? Like, when? That's a good question. And he, he, he's, he's right. I mean, you're never, you're never going to be walking through, um, like, a mall or shopping for a new Nike sweatshirt and have to, like, suddenly, like, factor out an expression to find your zeros. Like, you're never going to need that math, like, in your everyday life. But what it does teach you is how to like analytically think and how to use problem solving skills and think logistically and it just it changes your way of thinking. You're gonna be able to solve puzzles easier and think better. <laughs> right. But then as I was trying to tell them like how how it like makes you think better and strengthen your problem solving skills, a kid in the back goes, Well, I don't think I'm gonna need math going into what I'm going into and I was like, Well, what do you wanna do? <laughs> And he goes, I want to be a carpenter. And I was like, bud, <laughs> you need math for that. <laughs> Geometry. <laughs> and he goes, well, I'll figure it out. And I was like, yeah. And then that let me think, like, when when that had happened and he asked me, like, and he told me that he wanted to be a carpenter and that he's gonna, he doesn't need math. And, like, that's, I started, like, throwing out, like, all these jobs that you don't think are going to require some sort of math. And a lot of them do. Right. They're, cashier math you want to be any kind of teacher or at least a math teacher specifically you're really going to need math scientist math astronaut math (laughs) give me give me a basic job like Uh, it's you're gonna need any kind of construction worker math cashier well (laughs) cashier math (laughs) what i mean so there's a lot of it's it's never gonna be janitor factor expression very basic math to mix the proper amount of chemicals to clean oh wow okay that was good i'm trying to think of math uh things yeah 
it's like it's it's not it's that's the last thing it's never really hard now like you're not gonna have to calculate the curvature of a basketball as a janitor but there's someone out there that could do that <laughs> you know and if, you, if you're given a situation where you need to <laughs> way down the road maybe you'll maybe you'll know how wonder, but for the <laughs> most part it's just getting you to think better <laughs> i wonder what it's person i wonder what person for their job has ever there's seven billion people on this earth you think someone for their job has ever calculated the curvature of a basketball for yes. their for like their job? Yep. Yep. What do you think their I job do. was? I don't know. <laughs> any any kind of physicist who might have been doing something to measure something not directly associated to the basketball but had to consider the basketball as a factor of something, they might have had to calculate the curvature. I also think that there's something else. I don't know. Maybe like way early in the day, if you had to like physically make a basketball, maybe you had to calculate the curvature of that for some reason. I don't know why you need to do that, but maybe. Yeah. But I feel like for the most part, it's going to be like a physicist who needs to like figure something out and just has to consider that as a factor that might change things. Maybe a physicist was trying to relate. Uh, um trying to relate the size of the earth to a basketball that could be something i don't know i don't know either <laughs> i feel like usually if you're calculating if you're calculating the curvature or something that's going to be for things that are very big like planets so like if you're if you want to be an astrophysicist you're gonna need that if you want to be the i don't know the next big astrophysicist you're gonna need to know how to calculate the curvature of planets true you know what my favorite one-liner is? What? Y equals MX plus B. <laughs> <laughs> Just using your own jokes? <laughs> wow. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. I have all these comics in there. I wanted to. I just wanted to put them there so people could like appreciate. Yeah, like. George, not the jokes. One over one third says to four over three. I will not let you leave this house looking so improper, young lady. It's just... Yeah, I thought it was, I thought it was funny. <laughs> I also like the, the, the one on the top right that's like the comic. It was like, I want to get rid of math or I'm going to create something that gets rid of math forever. And his dad tells him you'll need math for that. I thought that was really funny because if I ever have a kid tell me that in the future, I'm going to say that to them. <laughs> because it's, it's true. <laughs> I, feel, I feel like that is a common statement between kids that are like, doing multiplication tables and they can't calculate eight times eight so they're like oh i hate math i just want to get rid of it forever yeah you're gonna need math for that you're gonna need math to do that i'm gonna be like what yeah so do you think yeah, math do. is the most important subject yes yep math if you if you were to tear something down to be the very like basic root of something like the, the very basic understanding of something tear it apart like we talked about earlier, if you could just keep zooming in into something, nine times out of ten, it's going to come down to math. I like how this is zooming in. Zooming in, thank you for coming back. Do you think 20 years ago this is what people did to zoom in? No. That's, <laughs> That's like, crazy. You tell a kid to take a picture right now, like pretend <laughs> to take a picture. Like we might go like, <laughs> but they go. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's crazy. I never thought about that until you did it. I was like, I wonder if that is like a universal thing. Or like, or if that's just new. Well, how would you twist something? I guess to zoom in. Like if this. you if you were before a phone to do it, or any kind of technology that zooms in like that, like how like it's usually like dial or something. I don't know. Trying to think on a camera, like I zoom in the lens by twisting the lens. Yeah, I, don't I mean, I don't think anyone's gonna be like, let's zoom in on that. I wonder how people Maybe. zoomed in when. I wonder how people like in conversation zoomed in when, like our yeah, parents like, were in like high school. How, they wouldn't do that, right? They wouldn't. <laughs> Whoa. Okay. I'm not trying to get down that rabbit hole right now. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. So defending maths. What's what's? Defending math. What are you defending? I just I just wanted to quickly remind people that we need it and that it, it's very important and that you can't get rid of it and for all those times when you're 
and you're in a math class, you're in your college, or because I, I was, I'm also a math tutor, and I was tutoring someone who came in who wants to be a math teacher, and she was mad about taking calc. She's like, why am I going to need to take calc? I wish I <laughs> well, had calc. Well, if you ever, if you ever teach pre-calc, you're going to need calc. You're going to need to know how to do calculus. But she was very mad about it. And I didn't, I was, I was so like, I, I was like, what? You don't <laughs> want to take calc and you're going to be a math teacher? What are you doing? Elementary math teacher. No, she wanted to be a high school math teacher. Well, um, I guess she must have really loved Elvis too. She like specifically I, want to work yeah. with freshmen and not like the so smart like... freshmen, just like the average to dumb freshmen. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. But I think about that one a lot, too. I always think about that. Like, why do I need this? Because <laughs> you're going to be a math teacher. And eventually, if you're, especially if you're at one of those, like, very, um, I don't not, like, prestigious, but, like, just more advanced high schools where they can afford to, like, keep moving, like, like the kids that understand it ahead farther. Like, you might yeah. have a Calc 1 class in your high school. Or you might have a Calc 2 class in your high school. So, like, you're going to know how to teach it. I had calculus classes in my high school, but I never took them because, for the record, I was an average kid. I think I was the most average. Oh, my God. No, like, I'm serious. I think I was the most average high schooler class-wise ever. Well, not ever, because my senior... Well, actually, yeah, because freshman year, I took Algebra 1. No. Yeah? Sophomore year, I took... Yeah, Algebra 1. Normal, a.k.a. average. Sophomore year, I took geometry. Junior year, I took algebra two. Senior year, I took functions and pre-calc. I think it was called functions and something else, which is just pre-calc, so same thing. So yeah, that is basic outline of high school math in order, basically. You could probably take switch geometry and algebra, but that's typically how they do it, right? I think so. I mean, that was like, you you don't know because you uh <laughs> you did that all in one year <laughs> or you did that all no, in middle school did, or something. I did that same lineup except I started in eighth grade. That's, so, I was one year ahead. Yeah, so instead of doing an AP class, um, we didn't have AP. So disclaimer for anyone that doesn't know that my school does not offer AP classes. And for my Swedish people out there or any European or anyone outside the United States, AP is just an advanced college level class, but in high school and in high school, not through a college. The only AP class I took was AP chemistry and I actually did pretty good. I didn't do too bad. I got a B, which was the equivalent to an A. Um, so in your GPA, so that was pretty cool. Anyways, let's stop reflecting on high school. Are you ready to move on? Yeah, I'm okay with what we, what we talked about. What shape is an empty bird cage? Polygon. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We are back with the bee's knees, part two. By the way, I, uh, Blue Nix, uh, stick around because they have some. Rose has something you'd probably like a lot on your next segment. I know you're about to fall asleep, but like, Rose has a good segment for you since you know Python and stuff. By the way, Rose, this is the dude that knows Python and I think JavaScript. I have his resume memorized in my head. And he's like younger than us both. And this is a, he makes apps sometimes. And he's my is buddy. this like is this a different computer guy or is it the, a the different one? one. He's a young kid. Okay. Oh, okay. He, he's coding with Python right now. I always see him coding on Discord. But anyways, um, this dude, um, I mean, this next segment, The Bee's Knees, part dos. Two. Two. So there was never a Bee's Knees part one, but I had a bee segment. I did talk about bees, so this is part two. Uh, I think I told, I, I told people I want to talk about bees again because bees are amazing. And I probably will talk about bees yet again another time, weeks from now, maybe months. But last time I talked about bees, I just talked about the difference between a honeybee and a bumblebee, basically. That was like the whole moral of the story that bumblebees can sting. And a lot of people are like, yeah, those big ones, yeah, they don't sting. 
Actually, they can sting and they don't die from it. Whereas honeybees, they die from stinging. So the bumblebees are just so docile that they don't sting. So that's a misconception that I cleared up in the air. Now, um, I'm going to talk about the social structure, well, social, I guess, but social structure of the bees and the roles that each bee has throughout its lifespan because it's changing. It's not just like, oh, you're assigned to be a so-and-so for the rest of your life. That's what you got to do. You can't change it. No, it's like life cycle, which makes more sense to me than a bee just being assigned something because it's not like they are talking to each other in English and being like, all right, this is what you do for the rest of your life. And then it's not like some bees are rebelling against the other whole colony and just being like, I don't want to be that. I'm going to go do this instead. But anyways, so it's pretty well documented um, what bees do. And I just thought it was cool to share. So here's what a honeybee looks like <laughs> in, just case, yeah. in case you lived under a rock like Patrick Starr and um, don't know what we're talking about. But anyways, let's go through the list. We have a queen bee. Now, this is Arta, not, I guess artificially. Yeah, artificially marked. Queen bees do not have green paint on them or whatever this substance is that's on this bee but the queen bee is usually typically bigger and a little bit longer and it looks like the wings are similar in size but it might be a little bit bigger but they're just structurally different every other bee looks about the same size so queen bees are pretty actually pretty easy to spot because you typically see bees gather around the queen Three. bee so if you ever seen a video of this of a beekeeper um looking for a queen bee they have cages specifically for that queen bee if they need to move a whole colony they move the entire the entire colony by capturing just the queen bee in a little bee cage it's so cute the bee cage is so cute and then they capture the queen bee and they move the queen bee into like another box and all the bees will just march on in because they have all these bees have pheromones and the queen bee is emitting pheromones at all times to keep the other female bees sexually immature enough to become the next queen bee. So as long as they that keep... That's so weird. To me. That's that weird. That is so weird. Yeah. Yeah. Basically, the majority of animals, There's that's good. Because I don't know for a fact that all animals do this, but the majority of animals, including humans, release pheromones naturally. Right, yeah. but I don't really pheromones to prevent another woman from being right. A and the, that part's weird. <laughs> yeah, it'd be weird if you did that. Um, and I'm pretty sure you actually release pheromones from specific spots, and I think it might be armpits around the nipples and some one place. Oh yeah, around the pubic hair. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm dead serious. I'm pretty sure it's those spots that you release it. So basically, where you grow hair. Um, other than your head. Look it up. I could be wrong, but I've heard that before. Is it female specifically, or is it like nope. just human? Like, look up where do humans release pheromones. Put that. But uh, anyways, humans releasing pheromones, look up dormitory effect. It's basically where um, I'll tell you what it, it is, definition, and then I'll tell you the theory of why it exists. Now, dormitory effect is if a group of females live together for a long period of time, eventually their periods will all line up around the same time. Uh, for not as much slang, their menstrual cycles will all line up around the same exact time. Now, this is theorized to happen like this because back when humans were hunter and gatherers, the females would have an advantage over the men if all of their um, menstrual cycles lined up at the same time. They would have an advantage over these men, or the men of the tribe, by all, I think, either having babies at the same time or just like, yada, yada, yada. Uh, there's just like a theory there with like them having a certain advantage or a certain something. A benefit there to all menstruating at the same time so that's a theory and uh a benefit huh 
Yeah. I I don't remember exactly, but that's just the theory about it. And then the dormitory effect is real. See, I heard that they did a, like, a experiment where they put, like, so many girls in, like, the same place together and, like, they lived together for so long, and but their cycles didn't sync. Yeah, Which, I'm assuming. I don't know how to choose it. Well, don't you? A woman. So, like, you have your, there are times where, like, everyone that you're around, like, you got guys sync. So, I don't know. I'm torn about it because I feel like I've experienced well, you've it. you've lived also... in a dorm with girls, do it, does it sync? There has been times, yeah. But that could be totally coincidental. Co- coincidental. Right. So it's also, I think, the dormitory effect could also be a theory because it's not very popular in, like, general knowledge where everyone's just like, yada, yada, yada. But if it was, if it is absolutely true, it's because pheromones are released in the air just naturally and you don't even know you're taking them in. You don't even know you're releasing them. Horses release pheromones and they open their lips up. I don't know if you've ever seen a horse or been around horses long enough where you see them open up their lips. It's because they're taking in air and they're making it hit their vomero nasal organ which is the organ to have air come in put the molecules on the organ and these molecules if they pick up certain molecules they will send signals to a certain part of your brain and that brain and it'll do a certain action of whatever and release hormones or whatever so that's how snakes smell <laughs> Snakes mastered this by smelling that way with their vomero nasal organ and flicking their tongue out, collecting molecules in the general area that they flick it out, bring it in, yada, yada, yada. Bees also use pheromones or bee perfume, whatever you want to call it. Um, <laughs> and the queen bee always emits it. Now, that's just queen bee. Let me get to the other rules. <laughs> <laughs> so now here's the most boring role or the most fun role you've ever heard in your life. It is the drone bees. Now, the drone bees are the males. I think it might be all the males. I'm not quite sure. Um, But definitely all the drones are males. And Mm. their sole purpose in life (laughs) is to fertilize new queens. Now, they don't fertilize new queens within their own colony because that would lead to a non-viable population due to inbreeding so yeah now these boys don't have stingers nor do they have i think it is only i think it is all males so they don't have stingers nor do they have the body to collect pollen and they are so low on the totem pole (laughs) they're so they literally just reproduce like with other queens it's crazy but they are so low on the totem pole that um if the colony is starving and is low on resources, they will get rejected from the colony. And yeah, by whatever, they'll get rejected by the colony and get thrown out and die. So drone bees, let's pour one out for drone bees. (laughs) (laughs) So anyways, the rest are workers and I'm pretty sure they're all female. And there's a lot of different roles that all these worker bees have, and they come with, and they go in like a certain order. The only ones I'm like weird about is the nurse bees. So I'm gonna start with the nurse ones. I don't know what order, what part of the order this one is. But anyways, the nurse bees. Yes, they have nurses in a colony. They have nurses. They these care for the larva, so uh, or larvae, um, or larvae. There's like another pronunciation. Everyone says it different. But anyways, bees, as if you don't know, they, as babies, they're larvae, and then they sprout up from being larvae, and they go into bees. And when they're young, they get certain roles, and I'll continue that later. But anyways, nurse bees care for them by f- taking nectar and pollen to them and other cells and storing them. And then they also do this cool thing by feeding future queen bees this is how queen bees come to be they feed future queen bees royal jelly is what it's called what what is royal jelly like what you've heard it before it... well yeah because i remember the during our first bee segment we, i asked like what happens if the queen bee dies and that's where i learned that she releases some pheromone to like prevent the other ladies from doing their own thing Mm-hmm. But I didn't know how true it was, so now I, now I know it's true. But um, 
then I was looking up like so how do they replace it and one of the parts that it talked about was how they the larva are fed so like royal the, the nurse bees uh emit this certain type of liquid or substance out of their head and they call it royal jelly like they as in like just people general people and it emits from their head and it triggers certain hormones or whatever within the bee to become mature enough to be a queen bee whether it's for that colony or a different one and they do this to about 10 to 20 bees in the thousands of bees in the colony so it's not like a lot of bees or even most of the women it's like very few bees I'm assuming, of course, some bees don't make it, some queen bees don't make it, and that's why there's they do it to not just one. Mm -hmm. So, so yeah, this royal jelly is like from within another bee, and it gets excreted into this other bee, and it's crazy. So, um, I feel like you know what they could do with this whole plot line of like replacing the queen bee is this would be a really interesting like movie. Movie. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's the bee movie. <laughs> that's why. <laughs> that's why in the bee movie you have a working class like you have classes you have roles you have jobs it's because it's right. well documented that everything is a different job so was there a queen bee in the bee movie i don't remember i don't know I, I have to rem i would have to rewatch. i'm sure it's not that accurate that, that needs to be its own thing but i when i admit like when i imagine this movie i like imagine it like with real bees so like you know like cgi to make it look like they're talking to each other or whatever but like you know how like they make like dogs do stuff in movies like real dogs but then they'll like cgi like get talking <laughs> yeah those tend to be like movies i can't stand to watch <laughs> i know but that, that's the kind of movie i imagine this one to be because i want it to be very like real in terms of like how bees act and like what they do like i don't want it to be like an animated movie i want it to be like legit yeah i mean so obviously it has to be like animated in some ways but like I don't know, it'd be cool. I can maybe, see it. Maybe <laughs> if Pixar made a B movie. And then Yeah, we can make uh, an ant. Do they ants? Do they make ants? No, DreamWorks I think made ants and then Pixar or and or Disney made Bugs Life. Oh. I think well, DreamWorks made ants and they were made in within similar years. So they're like trying to outcompete each other. But anyways, that's besides the point. Next up is when these are like the younger bees this is like the youngest bees builder bees they builders is what they that's their role and these guys once they're old enough to produce which is only after a couple of days after their larva they grow really fast they produce beeswax and they're able to, they're old enough to produce beeswax and um they start building they build these hexagonal shapes right yeah hexagonal which is made up of triangles which is the strongest shape so they know their shit somehow and i think just over time it just hexagons are the best way to make i don't know um but yeah and they just build that's as simple as that that's what a builder does now uh you might not know but colonies have janitors and they're called cleaner bees and they literally they're soup they're also very young bees it's like the next stage and they clean cells and these cells are used for larva and storage for their nectar and stuff like that and so they clean them out and then they empty it for new things to put inside of the cells simple as that cleaner they have bees have bees there's gender to bees working right now it's crazy um next one is a cool one they have undertakers these ones are undertaker bees uh i did not know about this but or i just never thought about it but uh older bees these ones are a little bit older and they remove dead bees and corpses and they move them far away out of the hive and they also get rid of diseased bees and before they, before they start cool. causing trouble to the colony. So it's cool that there's like a specific role for that. 
And here's another cool one. This one's really cool. There are temperature controllers. This is what this one's called. So these bees, <laughs> they go out and get water for fanning bees. I don't know if they go out or they get water from within, but they get water for the fanning bees, which I think they also might fan, but they fan their wings to create an airflow within the hive and that cools down the hive. Wow. And then it also cools it down by the water evaporating. So. Wow. Yeah. They have a thermostat system. They have janitors. <laughs> they have undertakers. Um, and guess what? They also have security. So the next role, a little bit older bee, is... Uh, this is the last task before their last job. So it's the second to last thing they do in life. Does that mean that all of the bees have at one point worked these jobs? I think so, yeah. Oh, I don't wow. know about so nurse. It's like promotion? <laughs> yeah, it's like a promotion. <laughs> <laughs> or a birthday, whatever. But um, <laughs> last their last task before going out and becoming a forager, which is the most famous bee, the ones you see on flowers and stuff like that. Mm-hmm is the guard they are guard bees now these bees they inspect every returning bee for a scent that they recognize from their own hive so they're kind of like a bouncer outside of a nightclub and mm -hmm. they card you by smelling you and they detect the scent from the other bees so that's really cool uh of course they also defend and sting the living crap out of you if you get up in there um those are the these bees oh. and another cool really really cool thing is they look for cracks and entry points that aren't supposed to be there around the entire hive in case an intruder bee uh wants to break in so they are like security there's their security and literally they do as good as security on a bee level as they do as they would on a human level so yeah. I wonder, if, I wonder if there's ever been like a bee that just like doesn't know what he's doing. Like if, if that's possible for like a bee to just like wake up one day. <laughs> just like, be bad. <laughs> yeah. I wonder if some bees are just bad yeah, at their job. Too. They're just, they just suck. I wonder like in that case, would the undertaker just like throw them out of the hive? Uh, like, I don't them. know. Come out. I mean, if that even happens, I feel like, I feel like it has to have, 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 you yeah it has to have happened it has to have happened <laughs> probably at least once when some undertaker bee was like kicking him out yeah that's what i envy him <laughs> and then the huh. last roll before they die is the forager these guys they leave the hive they go forage for pollen and they uh forage for about an hour and they about do like 10 trips a day so they do this as soon as the sun rises and yeah 10 trips a day for about an hour they're workers they, they get crap done and then uh this is the final phase they do this uh when the bee reaches until the bee reaches about six to eight weeks and then once six to eight weeks hits and their death hits they usually die out in the field so they don't die in the hive usually and then uh, yeah they croak they fall or something I don't oh. know it's kind of weird I wonder if they just like ever die midair <laughs> that is so sad yeah so the forger <laughs> in the B movie were the cool guys yeah well they should be the old guys you know like the ones that are about to croak but yeah so life of a bee is really short um that's why they're always reproducing that's why they live to die they live to have something else their purpose of living is to create more living bees just so they could die or something i don't know like that but yeah bees are endangered i'm pretty sure so don't save kill bees. don't don't squash a bee save the bees Hmm? We, should, we should invest in t-shirts we should both buy save the bee t-shirts every time we talk about bees we have to wear them we should buy them 
Yep. I'll buy save the bees. Like I, when, when, when we return on Monday and we're like, what are we talking about tomorrow? We're gonna be like, oh my God, let's talk about bees tomorrow. Cause because there's still so much more to discover. <laughs> yeah. I tend to talk about bees when I'm like, oh, what else is there to talk about? Oh yeah. Bees are cool. Let me, let me pull that back out. <laughs> so there will be more on bees because bees, there's just so much behind bees. Like how do you, what other animal can you say has a function other than insects? I guess maybe even any other insect that has roles like that. I feel like insects are different in that way where some insects, maybe even ants might have roles, but they have Probably because I feel like most bugs have some kind of like colony based living where like yeah. most like mammals, right? I mean, I mean other prairie dogs other animals have some kind of like community aspect, but it's never to like be like, population amount as like you would have in like an ant colony or a bee colony right the only thing i could think of is prairie dogs or like meerkats the only roles i can think of though are scout and regular prairie dog <laughs> so dick a tunnel dick dick a tunnel okay <laughs> next <laughs> next up is <laughs> super computer S yay or Yes, I had to Rose. refresh my own memory on like what I was talking about when you when we came to the decision that I was going to be talking about this yep. again. Um, okay, so uh, I was sitting in my little secretary office right now, and um, I was trying. I, I always I've always had this question of like what what the hell is is it, is it like what is it what is a supercomputer? Because I remember like talking to a friend. Who was talking to someone else who had said that oh i'm working on the supercomputer for the college right now i was like what is it i don't know well now i know supercomputer is a very powerful computer right and that's if you were to ask anyone that's typically what they say but what that means is that they uh have more than one cpus what's a cpu it's a central processing unit which means uh processing unit is essentially like running the instructions Brain. of what a computer program will be doing right so it's what is it called? Brain. Processing the information, you know? Yeah. Brain. Yeah. Brain. So, normal computer, one CPU. Supercomputer, many CPUs. Bigger brain. It can do more. It can handle more. So then I'm like, well, why do we need it? What do we use it for? One of the big things that everything, for some reason, was like the first thing that every list gave me was weather forecasting. And I was kind of shocked by that. So I'm like, why in the hell do I need a supercomputer? to hmm. handle a weather forecast and i guess for the most part it's actually used for like extreme weather so like if i feel like a hurricane's coming up and i need to be able to calculate like the possibilities of like the damages it could have or like the different ways it could turn or like what's the probability of it going this way versus this way or like what's the speed and if i need to process all this information quickly in order to get it out to people and getting it out to people is a whole different thing Mm. But if I need to be able to process all this information so fast, you need a supercomputer in order to run all the calculations as fast as you can. Right. And another interesting thing about supercomputers is that because they're always working at a higher rate and they're trying to process so much speed or in, the, in a fast speed, um, they get hot, right? Right. So computers don't run well hot. It's the same if you leave your phone out in the sun – and then you try, then you bring it inside a cool sound or something, and you're playing, like, an app that takes a lot, and your phone's on fire, and eventually it shuts down. <laughs> like, it, it can't handle it. Any computer can't handle getting too hot. So a supercomputer, if they put all the um, processors and memory circuits in a cryogenic fluid to achieve a lower temp. Yeah, there's That's actually cool. there's actually computers. Um, there's a certain liquid. So... On supercomputers, there's also gaming computers, <laughs> and I have one because I built one, and a lot of them are, like, pre-built, and a lot of them are self-built. Uh, pre-built are a little bit more expensive than self-built because it's just more convenient. Also, people need a business and make money, and business is just upcharging just a little bit or just a lot of it mm -hmm. to make money. So, anyways, gaming computer, a lot of people go sh fancy schmancy. A lot of people go like, all right, minimalist. There are some people that go above fancy smanchy and go to ridiculous. Those people usually make videos about their computers. 
Now, there are there is an aquarium computer or an underwater computer. The entire computer is submerged in liquid, and it's not regular yeah. water. It's a f- certain fluid where your comu- where electricity is not going to spark out because it's the it's the cryogenic liquid. Yeah, it's like I'm saying, but that's what it is. Yeah, it's it's yeah, it's basically on a chemistry level. It's a liquid that will not react with the electrons and electricity to spark out like water would. Because honestly, when it comes down to it, it's majority of liquids would, yes, damage it. But there are some liquids out there that are not probably natural and would not react with the computer. So it's, I don't know, that's cool. So that's probably what you're talking about, right? It is, yeah. That's yeah. that's the liquid that they use in like, I, for the I, Thing. That's what I would think they would use it for because it makes sense. You'd use it in a gaming computer that's going to get hot. Um, would be to use a liquid that's not going to hard the computer, but also keep it at a lower temp. Right. And it's also, convenient. there's on every CPU, basically, there's a fan directly blowing on it to cool it down. And mm-hmm. some CPUs have this thing called water cooling. And it basically is a pipe like geothermal heating and cooling to a house pipe that runs near it and it will cool it with water but it's not touching the actual cpu like the other thing we're talking about so i just thought i'd throw that out there since i actually know something about it yeah that's good yeah okay. <laughs> anyways okay so I, I kept looking into other things that we use them for so one of the big things that it's used for is for any like um scientific engineering work um so like uh physical simulations so if i need to be able to for some reason calculate some kind of physics experiment on a computer rather than you know use all the money to actually run the experiment multiple times you could do it on a supercomputer and it'll give you all the different possibilities the the stats the, and everything that you need to know for it um another thing that they use it for oops. oh uh it's a uh, crypto analysis so Wait. like um Supercomputers originally came around in during, I think, around World War II to help decode messages from, like, enemies. So there is a computer in Britain called Colossus that read and deciphered German messages in World War II. So it could read up to 5,000 characters a second. And that sounds like a lot, but now NASA supercomputer uh, called Columbia can, I think it does, mm. what, 42 and a half trillion operations per second that's stupid yeah so you went from 5,000 characters (laughs) a second to 42 and a half trillion operations per second that's so nasa supercomputer is pretty intense i think colossus is still around too columbia is still around like definitely still around too if you were to look up like columbia on like nasa computer it would pop up also isn't it isn't it true that i have more technology i have more power on my phone technological power on my phone than i than nasa did when they f- landed on the moon yep yeah yep. isn't that crazy <laughs> it is crazy it probably leads a lot of people to not believe the moon landing when they really should get their heads I know, back on i like to remain positive about the moon landing i like to say that we've been there but i know what do you mean but are you doubting that we landed I, I, on the moon? I think that we've been there, but I I have to remain skeptical. It's like, what if people are right? What if I'm just like sipping the Kool Aid? But I don't I don't think I'm sipping the Kool Aid. I I would think I would defend it, but I don't know. I I need to be able to defend it even more to be like this happened. But right now, if you ask me, if you were to tell me to defend it right it now, would, I would be very limited in what I could tell you. It would just say this. It would take. It would be harder to fake it than it would be to make it because of how much paperwork they have filled out about that moon landing and they probably still have it like it would they have it the only thing that i doubt or the only part of me that's like if i was someone what's that called what's it called a flat earther no no (laughs) What's it called when you like have like your own theory about everything? Like this isn't true. A conspiracy I, theorist. Yes. If I was if I was one of those that I would be like, well, if it's the government that wanted to beat the Russian government, 
and the little face race thing, then they probably, it, I bet yeah. they can do a lot, like fake all the paperwork that they would need to do so. That story lines up, uh, just a government trying to get at another government and trying to beat them in time, but I also think Americans are just better in that way, so we're kind of like awesome. <laughs> <laughs> God. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, okay, if I'm being honest, like, that was just a joke. I do genuinely think that America has a lot of, like, I don't know, they lead the world in a lot of things. And I think right. space exploration is led in the world by three countries. USA, China, and Russia. Mm-hmm. Not in that order. I think USA, <laughs> Russia, China, if I'm being honest. There's this cool app I have. It's called How Many People Are in Space? <laughs> and, um, or it's called Spe- People in Space. And it asks you how many people are in space. And it tells you how many people are in space. There's 10 people in space right now. <laughs> and they're from America, Germany, America, America, Russia, 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 China, China, China. I don't know which country you heard the most. But it seems to have a tie between Russia, America, and China. And those are the names that I said. So The only, um, oh, what was I going to say? I lost it. Sorry, Sweden doesn't Sweden. fund I lost. space exploration, blue nicks. But, yeah, I, I do think blue nicks brings up a good point. Maybe they switch their funding into space exploration more, and when you focus your funding in one spot, it might further it faster. Yeah. See, but you know, I don't. I definitely. I don't know. If, I don't know if we lead space exploration because maybe not anymore. They shut down. They shut down the whole program that was meant for space exploration back when uh, pre pre twenty twenty. <clears throat> let's say that right. Yeah, but isn't Artemis like the whole mission? It's not, like, Trump, not just one. I hope to God I'm right about this. To my knowledge, Trump reopened that because it, the specific program I'm thinking of within NASA that was meant for space, space exploration got shut down during the Obama presidency. And then, in, in like when they brought it back, and then of course you have Elon Musk who's manning his own general public can just fly into space now and try to commercialize space that gave us the possibility of um launching astronauts into space on our own like home ground because previous to that we were sending them to another country to be flown up to the international space station but now we have the power to launch them from the usa yeah we just did the other month with elon musk right Yes. Yeah. I remember that. But, what, six years ago, six or seven years ago, we did not do that. I yeah. think, I don't know. Also, to I'm my pretty sure that NASA only gets 0.25% or somewhere around there. They get less than 1% of the U.S. budget. They don't get 1%. Right. So... Which is still millions and millions and millions of dollars, but they actually get less than one percent of the U.S. budget, and uh, yeah, um, without keeping politics in this, just uh, yeah, I don't want politics in it. Yeah, no, <laughs> that's not that was not my point of bringing that up. Yeah, I just am like, oh god, I hear presidents' names. Oh god, I know, <laughs> run away. Yeah, no, one percent's fine. Um, anyways. NASA, the moon, we did land at the moon, and we have done multiple times since. So I don't know why. Yeah, I don't know. Artemis, like though, it? yeah, there's it's five times, five it's times. Like humans, our hu- our U.S. I'm humans. Pretty sure, I'm pretty sure I'm pretty sure it's five times. Look it up. I watch a lot of live streams of people arguing with flat earthers. There's been multiple people that said, uh, yeah, we land on the moon and actually we've done it five times. You just don't hear about it because no one cares after the first time. Um, so anyways, 
Artemis, I think, she, is the next time we're landing on the moon. It's not human, but it'll eventually be human again. And I think it will be like drones right now or rovers. But I think they're trying to set up a base on the moon. I could be wrong about that. So, I want to go to. I want NASA. I want NASA to tell me. <laughs> go to that website. Source. Wi -Fi. Trust me, bro. My sources. Trust me, bro. <laughs> so, anyways, uh, was that the supercomputer segment? We kind of got off tangent. On a tangent. Oh, um, I was gonna talk about Deep Blue, which is another super supercomputer, um, who beat the chess champion. I don't know this man, but I think I might have like seen a little documentary on him. So, like, I think I like can picture him but his name i'm gonna mess up it's gary casparo Casp k-a-s-p-a-r-o-b <laughs> Kasparov. and it was a six game match in 1997 but deep blue beat the chess champion and i think if this is the same man that i'm thinking of like this was the kind of guy that like could play a game walk up watch other games while his opponent is like trying to like figure out how to beat him and then he'll come back and keep playing the game and like he'll be fine he'll and he'll win because he's just that good and then there's another supercomputer named Man. watson who beat who beat ken jennings in jeopardy and he's now used by health oh, yeah. to, well he's now used by health insurers to pre pre predict patients diagnosis and treatments my computer yeah, could be anyone in jeopardy that's what I felt Google. when I read it. Like, no, no, Dodd's gonna beat me in Jeopardy because maybe like in terms of like speed, which I still feel like it's no duh, but that doesn't take know. anything about memorization. Jeopardy, I'm pretty sure they give you the topics that they might be going over. Well, if it's a super computer, you don't need to do that. You could just blindside it, and I feel like it's gonna be like, yeah, here's your answer. Well, yeah, I'm not even saying give a computer a hint because there is no such thing as hint to a computer, but. I'm saying, like, to humans, they give you, I'm pretty sure they give you hints. But regardless, hint or not, a computer would definitely be in jeopardy because it's just Google. It's just a search engine. So, I mean, like, if they didn't have a search engine, then I'd be impressed. But that would also be artificial intelligence. So then I'd be scared. We should talk about artificial intelligence someday. That'd be fun. Yes. I'm going back to who's walked on the moon. You know who? Who's walked Neil Armstrong, Buzz Aldrin. Apollo 12, Apollo 14. Because I'm like, I'm wondering, was it like, did they walk on the moon? Or did they like fly to the moon and fly back from the moon without ever actually touching the moon? Right. Right. Because I could see that happening, but stepping on the moon, I want to I wanna see more. Because if it has happened many times, why haven't we talked about it? And why hasn't there been videos? And like, why haven't we like defended it more? Because everyone only talks about Apollo 11. But I wonder too, maybe well, the argument also, isn't that hear. we haven't been to the moon, but maybe we weren't, but maybe the argument is more like we didn't make okay, it to the moon in Apollo 11. Here. It was just for the sake of the. Six, six, there were six crude landings, U.S. landings between 1969 and 1972, and numerous uncrewed landings. Boom. There you go. So, sorry, five was wrong. My bad, flat earthers. It's six. So, um,. <laughs> Next segment is called Deep Cut. I call this one Deep Cut because I'm going to be talking about the deep scattering layer. What? Dum, dum, dum. What is the deep scattering layer? Well, here's what it is. It looks like this on a graph. Rose doesn't see this graph, so I'll describe it to you. So what the deep scattering... Oh, you can I see. I pulled it up, but you can describe it to me still. <laughs> I will. Um, so, the deep scattering layer is what scientists once thought to be the ocean floor, because it 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 gets real low, it gets real low, and when you use technology to scan for the ocean floor, you don't ever see it. So they use like sonar technology to scan for the ocean floor. And they do this, and they see this big mass that's flat. And they're like, all right, that's the ocean floor. But then they scan it at night or during the day, one of the two, and it's at a different level in the same spot. So I'm like, um, what? Or they're like, what? 
And so what they do is they investigate, and it turns out that this layer is not actually the ocean floor. And it is what they call a deep scattering layer, and it's made up of fish and crustaceans. And so, um, what up, Mew? Thank you for the redeems. I can only do two out of three of those. I don't have my water around me, but much, <laughs> much love, my brother. And so anyways, this deep scattering layer is going around on TikTok. People are freaked out because they can't imagine a crap ton of different types of fish and crustaceans all coming together and making a layer that moves all together. So what this layer does, they'll sit at one spot and then they'll feed on whatever they feed on during the night and they'll rise almost to the surface or to the surface and then they'll fall during the day. And so they all do this to feed and they all stay together, I believe for protection. And I'm say I believe because when I see videos on this, it's like, oh, we scientists don't really know why these fish stay together as a pact and why there's multiple fish doing this. And they also believe that 65% of all fish in the ocean that do this, which I don't know if that number is even accurate, but it's a large number of fish that do this to the point where scientists thought it was the ocean floor when they do a sonar scan. And so I'm just like, this is pretty big. I don't know why more people don't know this. So anyways, um, I believe that these fish do it mainly for protection and then they also feed and that's why they move because some fish that aren't part of this, um, do this defensive maneuver against fish or against animals like dolphins that eat small fish. So just imagine your favorite fish in a school of fish and a dolphin wants to eat it and they usually start forming this circle and they all gather together they're not just like scatter boom and they all separate no they're usually like um what movie is that from i swear that's from... yeah it's not a movie that's a john mulaney story where he dropped where he, the the cops are coming and the one guy in the middle of the party <laughs> throws the bottle down just scatter <laughs> Yeah, it might be. Yeah. It's from yeah, it's definitely from something it might be that, yeah. But anyways. So you don't ever see you never see fish go like boom, scatter, bam, everything is gone. There's like hundreds of fish and they all school together and they form these things called bait balls. And that's like an actual thing. They're called bait balls. They basically go into this ball or a group and it's basically whoever's in the middle is the safest. And so they're always constantly trying to fight for the middle. Well, you're not always going to be in the middle and you're not always going to be on the outside. So if you can keep constantly trying to fight for the middle, you'll just form this ball, basically swimming in a circle and moving all together. And of course, there's different theories on how they all stay together with like a lateral line, yada, yada, yada. But regardless, they all move together in this thing called bait ball. And it's pretty effective move for fish. So they, that's why you always see it. And so I think this is just... <laughs> A huge way of saying more safe for them because if you're with a herd there's a way less chance you're gonna get eaten rather than if you're by yourself so think of it you're hiking and you're camping on a trip and there's a bear what are the chances you're gonna get eaten if you are with three people now what are the chances you're gonna get eaten if you're with 50 people much less mm -hmm. so you form together there's less chance and it's not like they know oh let me count how many fish are around me no it's just like instinct so right yeah so there is a thing on uh good night mew and blue nicks good night but there we're about to wrap up anyways but there is what was i about to say oh yeah there's many videos going on social media about deep scattering layer but do not fret it's not something super unnatural it's not something weird well it is something weird to us but it is completely normal don't fret it's just super interesting and that's that's what a deep scattering layer is and yeah it shifts 
it's like an ocean floor. If you were to look at sonar, it's an ocean floor that shifts, but it's actually not. It's just a huge, huge, huge group of fish and crustaceans. So, yeah. That's interesting. <laughs> Isn't it? Isn't it? Shiznit? <laughs> Um, I think that's, I think that's it. That's it for me. There we go. Is that it for you? <laughs> yeah, that was it for me. Sweet. All right. Well, do you have any closing statements? Any shout out? No. <laughs> All right. Well. Should I? Should I have one? Am I forgetting something? No. All right. Uh, I have no shout outs either. So whether you're on Twitch or YouTube, thank you for watching. Thank you for tuning in. Thanks for the people that tuned in live. Thanks for the people that tuned in not live. Uh, Y'all are awesome. And my name is Nolan. This is Rose. And this is Science HD. So we appreciate y'all and we're out of here. <laughs>